Allianz Life Insurance Company of North America has been keeping its promises since 1896 by helping Americans achieve their retirement income and protection goals. As an industry leader in risk management, Allianz has committed dedicated resources and invested in helping independent advisors integrate risk management solutions, including annuities, as part of a comprehensive wealth management practice. For more information, visit www.allianzlife.com slash RIA. Welcome to The Healthy Advisor, a podcast from wealthmanagement.com focused on advisors' personal well-being and healing. I'm Diana Britton, Managing Editor of wealthmanagement.com. And in this podcast, we explore some of the struggles and personal development issues facing advisors and financial services professionals, and how to get to a place of healing for mind, body, and spirit. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the Healthy Advisor podcast, and thanks for joining us. As you may know, this is the podcast focused on financial advisor health and wellness, and today's guest is somewhat of an expert on this very issue. Her name is Mary Martin, PhD. She's a mindfulness educator. Mary, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me, Diana. Yeah, and so Mary has quite the resume. She's been through years of rigorous training with Brown University um, to teach mindfulness-based stress reduction, as well as with mindful schools. And she has advanced training in trauma-sensitive mindfulness she also has a, a doctorate from the New York University School of Teaching and Learning. She's spent the last few years diving into futures thinking and was in the inaugural cohort of the Institute for the Future's Urgent Optimists. Um, am I missing anything there, Mary? I mean, you have just a lot of training in this space. That's That's fine. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. And so Mary's recently actually written a book as well, um, Mindfulness for Financial Advisors. Um, you know, she specifically focuses on our space. She also offers an eight-week course on mindfulness for advisors, where advisors can get CE credits for that course. Um, she's just a wealth of knowledge. I'm I'm really think hoping and and uh was thinking that um, you know, she'd be able to give uh, our listeners just a lot of practical tools for um, you know, just thriving in this industry and, um, you know, becoming more more healthy from a mindful perspective. Um, it can just be, uh, as as we all know, a, a very stressful, um, very stressful job. Um, so I wanted to start, Mary, just tell us a little bit about how you got into the work you're doing now. Sure, sure. Thanks. I was, I already had a mindfulness practice, was already doing mindfulness teaching and training. And it was in 2015, and I was writing the textbook for the uh, Financial Transitionist Institute's Certified Financial Transitionist Program, designation program. And Susan Bradley is the founder there. And she and her community of practice had built this, this huge inventory of tools for working with clients in transition. And on the personal side, so they would say uh, there are two sides of money, the personal and the technical, both are equally important and equally complex. So initially the book was based on those tools, but I was kind of like nudging it forward a little more because these tools were about as, as you know, financial planning tools are, and as their training is, they're tools for doing with clients. We're going to, you know, do this. We're going to do that. You're going to answer this. You're going to tell me that. Um, we're going to talk about this. We're going to plan that. So there's a lot of doing. And what I wanted to, to inject into this somehow was that there's, there also should be a conversation and training up around their way of being the way mm -hmm. they are, the way they're listening, the way they're showing up as a human being in, in this like shared space with their client, because that matters, you know, how, mm -hmm. how we interact as, as two human nervous systems is really important. And like, nobody's talking about that. And so that's, you know, not what the program was about, but I kind of, in, I, I 
tried to introduce it and I started with a module on deep listening. And I, so I brought mindful awareness and listening into the program and even created a learning experience and an assessment on, on listening that we even brought to the, the designation, the certification day long exam. There was a testing of listening at the time. So this is a while ago, 2016 and 17, we did this. And I wanted more though. It's not just about listening. So I, it's like taking something out of context and expecting them to, you know, they were just learning listening, but the deep listening is really emerges out of a mindful awareness of where your body is in space, the sounds that are around you, what's happening in your nervous system, what's happening in your mind, the nervous system that's in, that's across the, the table from you. So I, I sort of had to engineer this really artificial thing. And what I really wanted to do was to teach them ways of being. And that's why the course is subtitle and the book subtitle is practicing ways of being because that, that skillful listening and the skillful asking of questions and the skillful relational stuff comes from inside the advisor and it comes from their relationship to themselves. And so that really became my quest, you know, was to create a course like that, that was science-based and that really did the topic justice and that had plenty of opportunities for practice and reflection and inquiry. So to really teach financial advisors how to inhabit their own bodies, how to understand their own stress, how to understand their own emotions, and how to resource themselves, how to, how to really boost their well-being so that they are more helpful to their clients. So that's how it all started. That's great. I mean, it's so it's so needed. And, um, you know, that's a great segue um, because I want to talk a little bit about your own personal journey, you know, the things that happened in your own life that prompted you to focus on these things and to better understand yourself as as a human being. Um, so if you would, you know, tell us a little bit about your your story. Sure. I'll do the short version and I'll do the <laughs> so try to do like the PG ish version of this. So. I was a person who I would say was always, cons I was always interested in my well-being, yes, but it was more like my fitness and health. Mm -hmm. So I was always in really good shape and I ate really well. And, and I was always, you know, reading and learning and I did transcendental meditation and, but, but in reality, I was kind of what I call a brain walking around in a meat suit. You know, I was really concerned with my achieving, my intellectual achievements and my degrees. And and I was a ghostwriter for a long time. And all the, I wrote all these books and made all this money. And there was all these like trappings. Mm -hmm. and, and I also wasn't, this is a parallel storyline, is that I, I, I had always had this sort of uh, ambivalent relationship to becoming a parent. So mm. there were years where I was like, I'm never going to do that. And then there were years where I was like, I want a baby. Um, so I kind of went back and forth with that. And that was also combined with, I, I, for years from the start of just me going to the doctor, it was like, I had this sort of um, sketchy fertility, like, you know, it was really kind of an, an unknown. And so we didn't know mm. if I'd ever really have a baby. So mm. I didn't concentrate that much on that. I thought, well, you know, it looks like the cards really aren't aligned for this. I'm not that interested, whatever. So I didn't pay it. This is, this is key. I did not pay attention to mm. that part of my life. And there I was about 20 years ago, uh, visiting my cousin in Princeton and my godchildren. And I started like hemorrhaging. And oh, I was in a lot of pain and it was just really weird. And so I call my doctor just completely normal. And I say, you know, this is strange. And so I make an appointment, you know, mm -hmm. like I make an appointment, like there's nothing wrong and for, you know, I, well, I'm still going to be in Princeton for the next couple of days. I'll see you on Wednesday or whatever. And so I get to the doctor and the, the interim couple of days were really painful. No point did I think I should go to the hospital mm. and no point did I think that something was horribly, horribly wrong. So the doctor says, you know, really calmly, he says, so we, you can get pregnant because you're mm. pregnant. Mm. Um, but the bad news is 
you're you've been miscarrying since like for, for the last six days. That's what's oh my god. That's what's been happening, and you maybe should have come in sooner. And now you have to have a DNX, which means extraction. I mm. was like five months pregnant, and I didn't oh, wow. know it. And then I parlayed that into having a miscarriage, and didn't like it didn't occur to me at all. So fast forward a couple of months and I'm at a party at the house of a therapist with actually a lot of therapists and I hear them talking about me and I overhear one says, I can't believe that happened to Mary. And the other one says, of course that happened to Mary. Mary doesn't live in her body. Mm -hmm. And so because I overhear this and because I'm, I will never say no to a confrontation, I march right up to her and I say, so tell me more about that. You know, that's such an intro, it resonates for some reason. And she goes to her bookcase and she pulls out, you know, wherever you go, there you are by John Kabat-Zinn. And she says, look, just read this. Just, just, just read this. We don't need to talk about this right now. This is my party. Read this book. Don't read this book. Talk to you later. So I read the book and, and then I get, I, I really start getting into mindfulness practice and it really changes my relationship to myself because I realized that I, I really wasn't living in my body. I, I may have cared for it in some ways or the outer layers of it. I certainly cared about my brain. I certainly cared about what I put in my body. So like my longevity and my internal health. But when it came to my emotions and the sensations in my body, I was just like not present for them at all. And mm. as a result of doing this work, I was, and I'm, and I'm really late to this game. So this is me at like 30 something and finally realizing what it is like to be a human being to, you know, to be a human instead of, instead of a human, as John says, not a human doing, but a human being. Mm. And, and that was my introduction to what it is like to live in a body, to have a body that you're like carrying around. And so it was the care and feeding. I was doing the care and feeding kind of wrong for a very long time. And uh, then I started tweaking it and, and things changed dramatically. Things I was interested changed. The people I hung out with changed. Things I did with my body changed. My habits changed. And I became very interested in well-being and the science of well-being and happiness and and the body and trauma. And so I really got into that. So that by the time I got to the point where I was working um, with advisors specifically, I, I came to it with that. I already lived through not paying attention. And I already lived through what it does to you, what it can do to you. And mm -hmm. I didn't want anybody else to, to, to have to do that. So I just wanted to bring it to as many people as I could. And the, the, the water I was swimming in at the time was financial advice. So I started there. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing that. I mean, I think a, a lot of people um, actually can relate. Tell us, can, what is mindfulness exactly? Can you explain that? It depends on who you ask, which is mm. part of the problem in the, the mindfulness sort of ecosystem um, is I, I, what I can tell you is the mindfulness that I teach is based in mindfulness-based stress reduction. And John Kevitson's definition is paying attention in a particular way to what's happening from moment to moment uh, without judgment. And so that's a lot in there. It's kind of a horrible sentence, but the point being the word calm isn't in there. The word relax isn't in there. The word optimism isn't in there. Positive thinking isn't in there. And this isn't about changing your experience, although mm -hmm. that's sort of the, the 2.0 version of it, but it, it's, it's initially getting to know your present moment experience and, and putting the welcome mat out for the entire spectrum of your human experience. So for things that you would judge or appraise as negative, for pain, for rumination, for positive thoughts, for love, for joy, for delight, for anger, for hatred, everything. So we're not grasping at for positive things and we're not pushing away negative things and we're not ignoring the neutral, which is what human beings tend to do. 
And mm -hmm. so because of the development of positive psychology, which is wonderful, and we can do some of that, but it's not about being positive. And so the well-being that has been documented to come from this practice, and this is the practice that it, it comes from. So when you read research on mindfulness and you see all this, these well-being stats, not just about focus and attention, but about emotional regulation and decreases in stress and decreases in anxiety. It, what people don't do is they don't look at the fine print about what the heck was the intervention that they used. And I can tell you, it's not breathing for five minutes. It's mm. you, if you want dramatic results, you have to do something fairly dramatic. And if you want long-term results, you have to keep doing that thing. So it's not a silver bullet. It doesn't quote like work quickly or miraculously. It's like you getting, getting to know your own experience and then learning about what upsets you, what your maladaptive patterns are, what thoughts you're driving yourself bananas with, um, what mm. stories you're telling yourself that aren't really true. And so with self-compassion and without judgment, so it's not like, I am i can't believe I think this way. I'm crazy. The first thing you hear people say is, I can't do this. My mind won't, won't be still. I can't clear my mind. Well, it's not about clearing your mind. So good news. It's not mm. about stopping your mind. So good news. You have a human mind. It's not going to stop generating thoughts. That's what it does. So if you think you're going to stop being in pain, thinking about things, thinking about things too much, having dumb thoughts, that's, it's, that none of that goes away. What happens is you realize you're doing it and you have skills if you want to shift your attention. So it's really about agency, knowing where your attention is, being at choice with your attention at any moment. And that could be while you're in pain. That could be while you're crying. That could be while you're happy. So you're not, it's, you're not changing yourself. You're not making yourself better. Like you're already whole. You're already fine, but let's get to know you and let's get to know how to work with this nervous system that you're walking around with because you're stuck with it until the day you die. Mm -hmm. So it would behoove you to get to know it because I have news for you. Your brain is running your life mm -hmm. and you, you need to learn how it's working and you need to decide what you're going to do about that. Well, I think that's, that's a really refreshing way to look at it that, you know, that, your thoughts aren't just going to go away and, and um, it's not, um, you know, silver bullet, but you have to keep working at it um, and, and be disciplined at it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this industry specifically and, and why do you think mindfulness and well-being are important for financial advisors? Okay. I can tell you this doesn't go over well. So see, hmm. but now I just primed you with this doesn't go over well. So I should have done that. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, and you, so here we go. So advisors, as you know, you said a little bit about this at the start, advisors are on the, the front lines of the mental health epidemic. You know, they're mm -hmm. on the front lines of the stress and distress epidemic. And there are financial anxieties and other anxieties that clients bring with them. And, and those anxieties, so that's that human being who's full of anxiety, whose nervous system is at the moment dysregulated. So is in like the opposite of regulated. So the nervous system is all haywire. And what, what that nervous system needs is another human nervous system that is not haywire. Mm -hmm. It needs a well, it needs to be met with a well-regulated, a we call it, we use the word resourced, a resourced nervous system that can help it to settle, that can help it feel safe, that can calm it, and that can act as an invitation. It's like your nervous system is well-resourced and it's saying to other nervous systems, oh, you know, I have plenty, come come over here, take some of mine. Like I have, mm. I have loads of resources. I'm, I'm like, I have enough for me and you. And the advisor needs to have that nervous system because if not, the more powerful nervous system in the room wins mm. and, and drags the other nervous system with it. So mm -hmm. if it's, so if that, if what, if a nervous system is going haywire and the other one isn't ready and resourced to deal with it, you're going down with the other person. And what that, that means sense. is yeah. you're not in control and you can't help. You can't help. So 
this is about nerd. This is about, you know, we're mammals. This is where, this is where people go, what? Like we're <laughs> social mammals and we have evolved to help and heal each other through our social connection from when we're like little, 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 my daughter had, it's, my daughter has, has this habit, had this habit of crying in school. She was homeschooled for the longest time. And she recently went back to school and, and I was trying to get to, and she's in therapy, but that, that doesn't seem to be working right now. So I was trying to figure out why she's, what's happening. And, and so the other day I said, so tell me why babies cry. And she said, when they're hungry. And I was like, nope. She said, they're in pain. And I was like, well, could be, but nope. She's like, they need to be changed. Nope. She's like, mom, why do babies cry? And I said, because they can't speak. Because mm. they don't have language. They can't tell you exactly what's wrong. So parents pay like, play like whack-a-mole with like, what's wrong? Until they find the thing that suits the kid. So, so when babies are little, they find ways to sell, to soothe themselves, to calm themselves, or they don't. And sometimes their parents will immediately come in, which, you know, when they're really little is, is super helpful. But you reach a point in your development where you should be more on your own. And so we have this thing called our social engagement system. When we're really little, either we learn to self-soothe or we don't, but then we have the social engagement system, which is sort of our first line of defense. And it's where, you know, we realize I don't have the resources for myself because nobody taught me or I just couldn't make them happen. So I reach out to another person for help. Mm -hmm. And I, maybe I cry. Mm -hmm. I, my voice is well received by others. My head tilts a little bit. And this is our first line of defense. And so I said to my daughter, you know, it's like you're going back to how you were when you were a baby, but you don't have to, because now you can, you can talk mm -hmm. and you can also you can also cultivate habits in your own body where you know that you can soothe yourself. At 12 years old, you can do this. If I could do it at 35, you could do it at 12. So you can learn how to regulate your own nervous system with practice. And you could learn the moment it feel the moment you start to feel like your your nervous system is starting to to go off. With practice, you learn that so that you can intervene with yourself mm. and you don't need somebody else to do that. So I think, I think part of the job of advisors is to be in a state of care with and for the client. And in order to do that, advisors need to be resourced. They need to always be ready to give resources to their clients. Lisa Feldman Barrett, fantastic neuroscience uh, scientist, uses the analogy of a body budget. She says, we all have a body budget. And if when your body budget is full, you have somebody can come to you for a withdrawal and you're still mm -hmm. fine. So you make deposits into other people's body budget and they take withdrawals from you. But your goal is to make sure yours is always full. And that is with habits of well-being. So when advisors talk about the customer experience, the client experience, you know, they're talking about uh, giving your clients the best experience. I I think this is kind of backwards. Yeah. Be because it's leaving out somebody really important. Mm -hmm. That the experience the client has isn't about the doing that you're doing with them. It's, it, it springs from the experience the advisor is having with themselves. Mm -hmm. So the AX, the advisor experience is really, for me, the foundation of uh, connection and trust and good relationships between and, and safe spaces for clients. So it starts with the advisor's own experience. And when I, and I, 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 I understand the reason that now the CFP board has, has, you know, added investor psychology, but still it's like all of the attention, behavioral finance, all of the attention on why the client is doing what they're doing, but how about the attention on how the advisor is being in the moment and how that contributes to the interaction? 
Yeah, I I just think that you put it so eloquently. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's just such a thing that advisors need to hear and need to know about. And and like you said to me earlier, you know, connection is an inside job. And I mean, what are some of the biggest hurdles that you found in getting advisors to get on board with this and embrace, uh, you know, mindfulness and and the teachings that you have? The most, the biggest one is the same one that I have with futures thinking. And it is that the first thing everybody wants to know is like, what's the ROI? And it's just so, Mm. it's, it's like, if you're going to ask that question, I almost don't even want to talk to you <laughs> because, <laughs> because like, I can't, I, I just, well, how do you I, track something like this? I I'm don't... just not in that headspace. Like I just, I, like, I'm not going to convince you if I can't. So Julie Fortin, so Julie Fortin, let's, I need to talk about Julie Fortin for a second because I adore her. So she um, and others wrote this spectacular paper that won the top, the FPA journals top award last year for their 2020 paper that has a name that like, I just have to look at because it's, it's, let me find it. Okay. Integrating and sorry, Julie, but integrating interpersonal neurobiology into financial planning, colon, practical applications to facilitate well-being. So they won the top award for this, which talks about mindfulness and talks about interpersonal neurobiology, which is exactly what I'm talking about here with the nervous system regulation. And Julie and I geek out about this all the time. And and she's coming on board actually to teach with me. And we've created a new class. And and what we what we wonder sometimes is why aren't people interested in this? Like how how come you're not interested in your own experience? You know, you're in this body, you have this mind this is, it's, it's, this is a relationship you're going to have for your whole life. And how come you don't want to look at it? Mm -hmm. It affects your relationship with every person in your life. So understanding how your own nervous system is, it affects your parenting, affects how you are at work. It, I mean, it, 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 it affects pretty much everything. It affects your financial situation because it affects your impulse control. It affects your emotion regulation. It affects your focus, your clarity, your values. There isn't really a, a meaningful part of your life that isn't affected by un, by mindfulness practices and by becoming more aware of how you operate as a, a, a brain nervous system body walking around. So do you want to be more clear and grounded during meetings? Do you want to be able to handle the anxiety and the stress and the emotions of your clients better? Do you want to improve your well-being? Do you want to expand your thinking and make it more flexible and more creative? Do you want to be more emotionally flexible? Because this is what these practices do for you. And if you say no to those things, I, great, that's fine. But I don't understand how people say no to that. Um, mm. So how it helps your business is it helps your relationships with your clients. It helps your relationship to your own, what you call stress. So lowering stress, lowering anxiety, increasing clarity, improving emotional granularity, improving flexibility in thinking, improving flexibility in emotions. So Mm. compassion, empathy, although empathy is kind of weird and I think misunderstood, but compassion, love, love. Mm. My husband's a CFP and my favorite thing about him is he and his clients are like are just in a love fest. They just mm. like they just like, they literally love each other. And I don't think that they're and and he'll tell anybody that. And so will his, the people he works with. And I don't understand why there isn't talk about that. Mm-hmm. I mean, how come we're not? How come we're not talking about love? Being why are we at least talking about being in a state of care for mm. human beings, not for finances, not for accounts a state of care for the human beings we serve. Wow. I, I'm, I'm just at a loss of words. I think that that's, um, you're exactly right. I wanted to talk a little bit about the futures, uh, thinking that you've studied 
you know, what have you, what did you learn from that? And, you know, especially as we're, you know, on, on 2023, a lot of folks are thinking about the future. How should advisors be thinking about the future? I think advi- I think everybody needs, and, and again, another parallel with mindfulness is that it completely changes you when you learn how to think about the future. It, it, what I mean is like, there is a thought process, like there is a, a way of thinking 10, 20, 30, or long-termism thousands of years out. I mean, that's what the whole effective altruist community is about, Th- thinking thousands and thousands of years out. So in the urgent optimist community, we, and as, as many futurists do, we, we usually do a 10 year thing and 10 years, cause th- that's a comfortable place at, because most people can place it. Most people can place it within their lifetimes. Mm-hmm. There are people who are fascinated with a thousand and 2000 years from now. And, and it's, it's actually a similar kind of work. And the reason it's important is it, it makes you less blindsided when things change because you realize how much things are changing right now. And you realize how much of what you might think is the future is already here once you start mm-hmm. looking. So it, so I recently said, um, it, no, and nobody liked this, by the way. Um, I said, you know, in 10 <laughs> years from now, if there are still human financial human advisors. advisors, you know, why? What is it that these human advisors are doing? And so plenty of people right now opt out of people and, and that's fine. And if so in 10 years and, and with the technology that's developing, it's totally possible that there are no human financial advisors in 10 years. So I could, I could argue that, and I could show you the signals of change for that, but the signals of change for there being human financial advisors is that people still work with humans, right? Mm. Um, and is that it, when it comes to the development of the technology, something we really don't have is, is the duplication of the sensing of a nervous system and being able to duplicate, giving it what it needs back. Like, whereas, yeah, we have rings that can tell us and clothing that can tell us about moods and emotions, and we have all kinds of sensors, but we're like nowhere near the technology of something being able to sense everything about you and giving you what you need as a human being. So for the, for the next 10 years, people are going to be doing that, but that's the only thing I can think of that people can do that social robots and AI and machine learning won't be able to do. Mm -hmm. They got everything else covered. So if you're going to have a business in 10 years, it's going to be because guess what? Your clients love you genuinely love you. You are connected. You have connection. You have trust. You have psychological safety. And that's going to be the thing creates the, the, the future advisor, the future successful advisor. It's going to be that they are human and they are leveraging. They know what makes them human and they're leveraging that. That yeah, that's was like close. No, you were you were spot on. I think I I really I think that's good news for a lot of advisors, and yeah. I also think that 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 is something that they should really think about and and um, you know try to you know shape themselves and shape their practice in that way for the future. And so I I really think that's a great takeaway. Um, I mean, I'd love to talk about this all day, um, but I, I'm afraid we're just about out of time. But I'd like to thank my guest, Mary Martin, for being on the podcast and sharing her just great, wonderful wisdom with us. I really think advisors are, are going to get a lot out of this. Um, if you'd like to reach out to Mary, um, you can reach her at mary at marymartinphd.com. You can also find out more information about her course at marymartinphd.com. Mary, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much, Danny. You have a great day. And if you yourself have a struggle, if you wish to share your experiences and help others in similar situations, please feel free to reach out to me at diana.britton at informa.com. I'd like to thank you for listening to The Healthy Advisor. If you've not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This is Diana Britton reminding you that where there's healing, there is hope. 
We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The Healthy Advisor, a podcast focused on advisors' personal well-being and healing. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of wealthmanagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your particular situation. Allianz Life Insurance Company of North America has been keeping its promises since 1896 by helping Americans achieve their retirement income and protection goals. As an industry leader in risk management, Allianz has committed dedicated resources and invested in helping independent advisors integrate risk management solutions, including annuities, as part of a comprehensive wealth management practice. For more information, visit www.allianzlife.com/RIA.